Hello and welcome to our second live stream video um, of the quarantine. We are here with Tim Smith. I'm going to pass it off to Tim um, in a few minutes. We are properly social distancing here. Uh, Tim Smith is our historian and collections manager at the Adams County Historical Society, and he's the author of over 10 uh, books, as well as uh, probably dozens of articles about the Battle of Gettysburg and local civilians. Um, he's a licensed battlefield guide, and uh, he is the author and biographer of a book um, about John Burns, the hero of Gettysburg. So without any further ado, I will turn it over to Tim, and he's going to, to give a presentation on Burns and his life. Please feel free to ask questions. We will be monitoring the questions throughout the program. Okay. So... John Burns, kind of an interesting figure in the history of uh, Gettysburg. And uh, I remember a number of years ago when I started researching John Burns, I realized that no one had written uh, a serious biography of him. And so I guess that's one of the things that uh, drew me to him. Uh, the other thing is that a lot of people write books about people because they like them or because they don't like them. And, um, you know, the books sometimes are very positive about the people or they're over the top negative about the people. And I, I don't know if I felt one way or another about Burns. I was just really interested in his story. Um, an interesting aspect of the story of John Burns is the fact that we have lots of accounts or interviews with Burns himself where he tells you details of his life and details of the fighting that took place and his involvement in it on July 1st, 1863. Um, I'd say, um, depending on how you count, there's probably like a dozen interviews or accounts that are written uh, where someone has interviewed him personally. Now, what I noticed right away is when you put all the different accounts together, you notice that they're different. And it's not like the story of John Burns got better as years went by. It just was different. Every time he told it, he added different details or changed this or that. And that was fascinating to me. So what I have tried to do in my research on John Burns, and if you uh, get a chance to look at my book, is take the basic story of Burns, and then I delve into each of the specific things that he says about his life and his involvement in the battle, and I can c compare them with other known uh, facts that we have and compare and contrast the stories. You know, um, as a licensed battlefield guide, I don't think I was ever obsessed with what is the truth about a certain subject. I don't mind the fact that there are different variations of the truth told by different people who are involved in the battle. I'm very interested in uh, how different people looked at different things. Obviously, in the story, there are things that Burns says that just don't stand um, uh, close scrutiny, but uh, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that. Now, the other thing is that um, um, John Burns was not exactly the most popular person in the town uh, prior to the Civil War. Uh, he was, John Burns was born in New Jersey. He uh, moved to Pennsylvania at a young age uh, he lived in Bucks County for a while. It seems like in the early 1820s, he moved to Adams County. Uh, he married a girl from um, Bonneville. Um, well, uh, she has some family in Hagerstown, Maryland also. Um, uh, and he moved around a lot. He didn't always live in the town of Gettysburg. He lived in Bonneville for a time. He lived in Cumberland Township. He lived in Manallan Township. In the tax records throughout the county, you see him floating around. Um, uh, one of the aspects of the Burns story that gets a lot of notoriety 
is the fact that he was a combat veteran of the War of 1812. And uh, he himself uh, describes his actions in the War of 1812 in several um, uh, you know, interviews. Um, he actually says that, uh, uh, that he fought uh, on the Canadian border, uh, that he was at the Battle of Lundy's Lane, in one of his interviews, he actually gives the name of his captain and the name of the regiment that he is with at the Battle of Lundy's Lane. Of course, that regiment is not at that battle. Um, some of the details he gives are convincing, but his name does not appear on the rolls of the unit that he says he's in. And this is something that I played around with for a while when I was researching his story, when I was working on the book. Uh, uh, there's an account that someone suggests he's at uh, Fort McHenry or involved in the Battle of Baltimore in 1814. And I thought that that might pan out for a while. As it turns out, Burns did serve in a unit in Philadelphia for a very short time during the War of 1812, but his unit saw no action. And he was definitely not at the Battle of Lundy's Lane. Um, some of the accounts suggest that Burns was a veteran of other wars. Um, one account suggests that he was in the Seminole War. One, uh, several accounts suggest that he fought in the Mexican War. But one would suppose to have fought in the Mexican War, you might have to travel to Mexico. And certainly, Burns was not part of any unit that did any such thing. Um, uh, some accounts suggest that at the outbreak of the Civil War, he tried to enlist in a local Gettysburg unit and even traveled to York with the Second Pennsylvania volunteers to try to enlist. We're not sure if that's exactly true, but Burns did end up being a teamster in uh, the early part of the war and working out of the Frederick Hagerstown area. We actually found some records that his name appears as a civilian contractor. And um, apparently uh, his wagon does come within range of hearing some of the firing at the Battle of Falling Waters in 1861. So he is near that battlefield. I think the point that I'd like to make here is that there's no evidence whatsoever that John Burns was involved in any military action prior to the uh, afternoon of July 1st when he fought in the Battle of Gettysburg. And this is an interesting concept considering all the attention that his prior military experience has given in various accounts. Um, in the local Gettysburg community, John Burns uh, had a number of uh, jobs that he was responsible for. We know that at some point or uh, on occasion, he helped David Kendallhart in his shoemaking business. Um, so he was a cobbler. Uh, we know that he was employed uh, by the Gettysburg Water Company for many years. And I perceive this as... Um, he's the person who probably operates the pump that pumps water from the wells up into the reservoir, which was uh, on the east side of um, Stratton Street, where it connects to East High Street. Uh, he also um, is the constable of the town of Gettysburg for a number of years. That's an elected position. So on and off, he is one of the two constables of the town. And this particular uh, image that I have up now is one of the constable's reports. And this one I picked is 1862. He's, Burns is not the constable at the time of the battle, which is in many accounts written of him, but he is the constable in 1862. And you can see here, if you read this carefully, uh, what the constable's uh, duties are. And you might notice, um, you might notice that he makes sure the index boards around the town are all in good shape, you know, meaning uh, 
in Baltimore Street or, or Washington Street. He makes sure that uh, there's no bastard children born in the town, that no deer are killed out of season, that, uh, uh, you know, people are um, not drinking at places that don't have a proper liquor license, that no gambling houses are in the town, and um, uh, there's no disturbances of the peace at the elections in the borough. Um, and you might notice on this particular one, uh, it mentions bastard children born what? Martha Gilbert, sex female, a female child, was born to Martha Gilbert. Martha Gilbert is John Burns' adopted daughter. Burns and his wife did not have children of their own, but they adopted this Martha Gilbert. And she, in 1862, gave birth to um, a child. I see um, someone has asked the questions about the rival, a rivalry between Jenny Wade and John Burns, and I will answer that, but we're going to um, uh, we're gonna get to that. Uh, somebody asked if uh, Burns carried a gun while he was a constable. I am not aware that the duties of the constable require them to carry a gun. Uh, I have never seen any allusion to that. Um, I wonder that probably at that time period, though, a lot of people did carry guns. Um, but uh, I don't think it was uh, specified as part of the job of the constable. So the constable's not like the sheriff. So um, they're usually more um, uh, carrying out duties of um, uh, issuing uh, um, uh, court documents and stuff like that. But uh, uh, I'll say right here, um, since somebody did ask about the rivalry between Jenny Wade and John Burns, that if you read my book, I mentioned in the footnotes that John Burns is accused by several citizens of the town as being the father of his adopted daughter's illegitimate child, which I find is interesting. Now, we don't have any proof that that's true, and we don't have any real reason besides these accusations by other mean-spirited citizens to suspect that's true. But the reason that I like to tell it and promote it is because John Burns himself had no problem spreading gossip and rumors about other people. So I think he deserves it. Okay. So, you know, um, in 1863, John Burns lived in a house at the western edge of the town of Gettysburg. And you might notice on this map that is um, from um, my John Burns book, He's living on the corner of Chambersburg Street and what is now West Street. On this map where Anthony Sellinger lives, that would be uh, the parking lot of the West Street uh, Shopping Center. And he lives uh, just east of that. You might look to the north. The, the map is configured uh, east-west instead of north-south. And... Um, you know, we got to Chambersburg Pike, which today is Buford Avenue, and then we got the Millerstown Road, which is slightly different than the modern. Hello, everyone. Sorry for the interruption. I think we are back. Uh, please let us know if you can hear. I think we, we lost the internet for a few seconds there. Here's Tim. Okay. I'm not sure exactly uh, where we were, but um, uh, on the morning of July 1st, John Burns goes out in front of his house and has an argument with several of his neighbors. Um, he thinks that everyone in the town should grab a musket and uh, go out and fight in the battle. Um, but uh, it seems like, uh, you know, I, 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 there's an inherent um, uh, issue, I guess, when we talk about John Burns and we talk about the other civilians of the town. Burns likes to set himself aside as the only civilian in the town that runs out and fights in the battle. And I think we have a tendency 
um, to portray Burns as sort of the ultimate civilian patriot who runs out, joins in the firing line, and fights in the battle. But the other people who live in the town, who maybe are a little more stable and rational, think it's a better idea to be in the basements or the cellars of their homes with their families and protecting their families. And so, um, uh, you know, um, as time goes by, um, people will poke fun at Burns for being such an enthusiast, enthusiastic uh, uh, participant in this um, fighting. And of course, you know, do we really think it's a good idea for civilians to join in armed conflict with uh, people who are actually mustered into the military service? It's a fast, fascinating question. Um, I'd like to just do, do an overview uh, timeline, sort of, uh, as an overview of what Burns is involved in on July 1st. Because when I decided to put this book together on Burns, um, I don't think a lot of people had thought about what actually he did on July 1st. I mention this because as a battlefield tour guide, when you go around the battlefield, you come to Burns Monument uh, near the McPherson Farm early in your tour. And there has been a tendency over the years amongst uh, tour books on the battlefield, especially, and interpretation of the battle to put him in the morning action. When in fact, he did not participate in the morning action of the first day. He actually participated in the afternoon action of July 1st and was not involved in the morning action at all. So here's a little timeline on this map. Number one, about eight o'clock, he leaves his home, argues with his neighbors and travels out to the field. Number two, he spends much of the morning in the area of the Lutheran Seminary. There is a great account where he's standing with supposedly the musket he used in the War of 1812, jumping up and down in front of the seminary building and encouraging the Iron Brigade as they went into battle. Number three, in the law of the battle, he goes back into the town and somehow puts his musket away and at that point obtains an actual musket, uh, a modern weapon, and starts once again for the field. Number four, about noon, he encounters the 150th Pennsylvania near the McPherson barn, and he attempts to join that unit. Uh, they, they say that he has an antiquated musket. They take it from him. They give him another musket, a more modern one. And then number five, about one o'clock, he joins the 7th Wisconsin in the eastern edge of the Herbst Woodlot or McPherson Woods, or the Reynolds Woods, depending on your terminology. Uh, according to the accounts of the Seventh Wisconsin, he's carrying an antiquated musket. They take the musket from him. They give him a more modern weapon. And, you know, a lot of the men at this point in encountering him uh, seem to have something to say. You know, it's to them, it's just a kind of a joke, or it's, a, it's a, a comedic, you know, interlude between the fighting. But Burns... Uh, Number six, uh, joins elements of the Seventh of Wisconsin, participates in the heavy fighting um, uh, near where the Seventh Wisconsin Monument is today. Uh, he doesn't run to the surprise of everyone. He fights in the battle. He is wounded in the fighting. Number seven, about 4 p.m., he is wounded during the retreat back towards Seminary Ridge. And he uh, falls to the ground. He's unconscious for a while. Uh, he wakes up early the next morning. And number eight, he crawls or is carried to the Riggs house along Seminary Ridge. And then number nine, some point during the afternoon of July 2nd, he is transported back to his home at the edge of the town by the Zellinger family. There are a few illustrations of Burns in the fighting. This one here. Um, I forget the date off the top of my head, I think it's about 1915, is a painting by Xanthus Smith of Philadelphia, where Burns is encountering the officers of the 150th uh, Pennsylvania. Um, I actually, I don't have it here in my show, but I have seen this in color. It's a really nice um, uh, painting that, uh, uh, that he did. Um, somebody asked if he had a flintlock musket. Um, there, 
there's a whole bunch of controversy about what exactly he is using and he's carrying at any given time. Like I said, supposedly he gets a rifle or a carbine from a cavalryman at the edge of the town before he comes out on the field. He may end up having it. He might have his slim lock musket in the morning when he's in front of the seminary building. But then he goes back into town and then he does not have it after that. And then when he gets to the 150th Pennsylvania, supposedly they give him a more modern weapon. And theoretically, he does something with his flintlock musket. But then when he goes to the south of Wisconsin, supposedly he has his flintlock musket again, and they give him a more, more modern weapon. Uh, and then he fights at the edge of the woods. Now, important in this story is the fact that when Matthew Brady comes to take his photograph, that flintlock musket is in the photograph. So he probably did not have it with him on the battlefield that afternoon because he probably would have lost it at some point if he had it, um, or maybe he hit it and went back and got it. It's a very difficult question uh, to answer. But clearly, the flintlock musket in Harrisburg that's on display is not what he used in the line of battle during the fighting. Okay. Um, we're very fortunate that there was a guy from Rochester, New York, named John White Johnston. And around uh, 1913, during the 50th anniversary of the battle, he became very interested in the story of John Burns. He actually did write a book about Jenny Wade, the true story of Jenny Wade. But he wanted to write a book on John Burns, never wrote the book, but all the things he collected and materials are at the Rochester Museum and Science Center, and I was able to go through his papers. This is a photograph taken by William Tipton in 1915 that shows near the spot where John Burns stood behind a group of trees and fought during the battle. These trees no longer stand, but as you can see, were really close to the monument of the 7th Wisconsin Infantry. And of course, he was on the firing line of the 7th Wisconsin at that time. He was wounded in the battle. We're not exactly sure how many times he was wounded. According to the various accounts by himself and others, he was wounded one time, two times, three times, four times, five times, or seven times. We know he wasn't wounded six times. But I would say that no matter how many times he may have been scraped by bullets or slightly wounded, the major wound that brought him down at the edge of the McPherson Woods or Herbst Woodlot was in the ankle. Uh, oddly enough, John Burns will receive a pension, but because it was a special pension, he never had to go through um, he never had to go through the process of a medical examination. And most pension records at the National Archives have detailed examinations by a surgeon to, that shows you where the person's wounded. And boy, do I wish we had one for Burns, but we just do not. Um, somebody asked if he killed a Confederate officer. There are several accounts that during the fire, he was on the firing line in the law of the battle, he went forward uh, towards Willoughby's Run. And of course, one of the stories that's told is that someone questions his ability to accurately fire his rifle. And he, in front of everyone, uh, shoots across uh, would be the country club property and brings down a Confederate officer on horseback and the horse rides away. So, um, uh, and that's a story that's told by him himself. There's probably no reason to believe that it has any basis, in fact, but you see that in a lot of early uh, accounts. So here's another 1915 photograph um, taken by William Tipton at the request of John White Johnson at Rochester, and it shows the spot where Burns fell and uh, spent the night on the ground. You can see it's on the um, eastern slope of McPherson's Ridge, and it's just east of uh, the Herbst Woodlot. As a matter of fact, you might see cannons in the background of this view of Gilbert Reynolds' um, 1st New York Light Artillery. But um, I've been to this spot several times. It's today just in the middle uh, of, uh, you know, the field. Uh, supposedly, when Burns fell, um, 
he threw his musket uh, and um, he took the ammunition out of his pocket and he buried it in a ditch, but um, uh, he lost consciousness. He woke up late at night and there were Confederate soldiers are asking him uh, what he was doing at that spot. And of course, in various accounts, Burns tells them that he either uh, he lost his cow, he didn't know where the cow was, and he got wounded while he's looking for it, or he tells them that his wife was very sick, and the doctor, his wife's doctor, lived out on um, uh, her ridge, and he was trying to get through the firing line to get a doctor for his wife. So these are the two different things that he says in his accounts. Of course, you know, we have no evidence that Burns owns uh, any cows at the time of the battle. It appears as if the Southerners don't really believe him, but he's wounded. He looks like he might be dying anyway, so they just leave him there. Early the next morning, he crawls towards Seminary Ridge and ends up at the Alexander Riggs house. Again, Another photograph recorded by William Tipton of the Alexander Riggs house on Seminary Ridge, just across from uh, the Thompson house, the site of Lee's headquarters. It's interesting uh, to consider the fact that Burns is laying a few yards from Robert E. Lee's headquarters. Um, he is actually on the cellar door according to one of the accounts. And um, William Tipton uh, records this view of the cellar door at the Riggs house for John White Johnston when he is working on this story. Um, and so he's there on the Riggs house uh, for much of the morning of July 2nd. Southern soldiers know he's there. They walk over, they talk to him. Um, uh, eventually, there will be a wagon that comes down the Chambersburg Pike, uh, and Michael Zellinger is, uh, uh, or Anthony, I'm sorry, Anthony Zellinger is um, I think we are back now. Uh, we'll put Tim back on. <laughs> <laughs> You have to excuse us for our, our technology where um, this is something new for us. Um, so we were talking about uh, uh, John Burns being wounded and laying on the cellar door of uh, the Riggs house. Um, I, he was not treated in any way, shape or form by Confederate doctors, although Confederate soldiers did talk to him throughout um, the early morning hours of July 2nd and into the time that he was taken to um, uh, taken to um, to town here, Andrew. Um, of course, some of you might know that we did a uh, um, a program at the Riggs House um, a number of years ago. And there was actually a um, an archaeological dig at the Riggs House. Okay, <laughs> okay. And uh, in our archaeology dig at the Riggs House, one of the things that we were really concerned with was finding the foundation of the house and seeing if we could find the exact location of the cellar door upon which Burns uh, was. Um, resting after the fight. And uh, we actually did find the door and um, uh, the house. Uh, if you uh, if you check out our video uh, on our uh, website about the archaeology dig, you can see that. So Burns is brought back into town. And I, I think this is just a remarkable illustration. It appeared in Harper's Weekly. And I believe it was in the August 22nd 1863 issue of Harper's Weekly, and it shows Burns being brought back to his house uh, on July 2nd. Now, the illustration is based on a photograph that was recorded uh, by the crew of Matthew Brady after the battle, and Brady's images are in this Harper's Weekly 
illustration, there's a little paragraph about Burns being brought back to his house in there. And so you can see here Burns being um, carried out of the wagon and back to his house. One of my favorite stories to tell about this came to me from um, a letter that was in the John White Johnston papers at the Rochester Museum and Science Center. He had corresponded with some veterans of the battle that had actually seen Burns on the battlefield and talked to him. And one of the people that wrote to Johnston was a guy in the seventh Wisconsin. He said that he had talked to Burns before the fighting and Burns had talked about where he lived. And after Burns was wounded, he stopped and knelt by Burns and Burns told him to go into town, to go into town to see his wife and to tell her that he was wounded in the fighting. And Burns went into town. He did, um, I should say, the soldier did go into the town. He saw the big white house with the high porch, as Burns had described. He went to the house and he knocked on the door and he told Mrs. Burns that, uh, you know, John had been wounded in the fighting. And she stood there for a moment, looked at him and then said, you know, I told him not to go out there. And apparently, according to the story, she did nothing. <laughs> and I, I'd really, really like to believe that's true. <laughs> It's a good story, if and nothing else. Um, Burns uh, is cared for by a local doctor. It's um, Robert Horner. Um, uh, the Horners are doctors in the town of Gettysburg at the time, and um, he does recover from his wounds. And um, uh, here is a image recorded by Matthew Brady. Uh, there are four images, I believe, recorded by Matthew Brady of Burns at his house after the battle. Uh, immediately after the battle, a reporter uh, interviews Burns, and there's a mention of Burns in the New York, uh, one of the New York newspapers after the fighting is over. So I think Matthew Brady must have seen that, come into the town, probably ask about Burns, went to his house, and took some photographs of him in front of his house. This particular image... Um, there, there are actually two different images you might know. Uh, you see here, this is the second one, and it's um, Burns' house uh, and Burns on the porch with his wife, Barbara. And these two images are the only known photographs of Barbara Burns, John's wife. I believe she dies in 1868, so she's not around for much uh not long, around too much longer after the battle. And you can see in this particular image, the musket um, uh, that we're discussing earlier against the wall. Um, there are, of course, are two much more famous images of Burns recorded by Matthew Brady. And one of them is Burns under his porch in front of his house uh, with the musket. Now, um, and his crutches. Now, um, that musket in that photograph, which is kind of cut down, uh, it's missing part of the stock, uh, that is absolutely the musket that is now on display in the Pennsylvania State Museum in Harrisburg. And according to the tag that came along with it, it says that that is the musket that John Burns used in the War of 1812. It doesn't say that's the musket he used during the Battle of Gettysburg. And again, it would be it would be really unreasonable for us to expect that he could have recovered that musket after the fighting and got it somehow back into the town or uh, retrieved it, it before this photograph was taken. So it makes sense that maybe he had that in the morning action, but that's not the one that he used in the battle. And it, it it's not reported to be the one that he used in the battle if you read the tag carefully. But that musket was actually uh, received by the State Museum, and it came from the Danner Collection of Gettysburg. It also appears in a photograph of relics that were on display at the Danner Museum in Gettysburg uh, in the 1880s. So it had been around the town for quite a while. Um, here's a variation of that same photograph. Uh, this time the 
crutches are behind him with a uh, musket leaning against the, the cellar door. Uh, and this is how that photograph appears uh, on the front cover of the August 22nd, 1863 edition of Harper's Weekly Magazine. And so in August of 1863, John Burns becomes a national celebrity. This is probably the magazine with the highest circulation in the United States at that time. So this is a big deal that he's on the front cover. So he's like the time man of the year or something. Four months after the battle, when Abraham Lincoln comes to give the famous Gettysburg Address, he insists upon meeting John Burns. And after the address, Burns is brought to the Wills house. Abraham Lincoln comes out and shakes his hand in front of dozens of reporters. And this is a very important moment in the story of Burns. All these reporters see this happen. A lot of them write about it, and John Burns becomes more of a celebrity. Lincoln and Burns attend a political rally at the Presbyterian Church, and uh, uh, you know Lincoln and Burns sit together, and from that moment on, Burns is a pretty big deal. Uh, in November of 1860, or I should say in early December, 1863, I think it's like December 7th, Congress reconvenes and bill number one, and I think it's promoted by like a congressman from New Hampshire, is to provide John Burns of Gettysburg with a pension. It goes through both houses and it is signed into law in February of 1864. And Burns goes to the White House. Uh, Burns goes to the White House. Um, he um, is there when Lincoln signs it, and newspaper reporters cover the event. And his story is once again publicized in newspapers all across the country. Someone asked why Burns wasn't taken prisoner by the Southerners. He was not taken prisoner because he was wounded. Now, when the Southerners were sweeping up all the soldiers in the Battle of Gettysburg that were captured, pretty much they, kept, they took prisoner men who were not wounded. If they were wounded, they left them in the hospitals around the town. They might uh, parole them on occasion, but they weren't taken a uh, wounded prisoner. Uh, an extraordinary event occurred in 1864. A newspaper editor in San Francisco saw one of these articles about Burns receiving a pension by the Congress and the president signing the act into law, and he decided to write a poem about John Burns. He had no knowledge of Burns except what he had read in this newspaper article. His name was Bret Hart, and he would become one of the more famous poets in the United States. And his poem, John Burns of Gettysburg, was printed and reprinted in newspapers and magazine and in books um, by Bret Hart. And it became very famous. Now, that's not the only person that was a promoter of Burns. We also, men we also mentioned Brady, Matthew Brady, Abraham Lincoln, um, Bret Hart, and N.C. Wyeth. N.C. Wyeth, the famous illustrator who did the illustrations for um, Treasure Island, actually did a painting of John Burns at Gettysburg. And through a misunderstanding of some of the words, uh, some of the words in the poem by Bret Hart, they have him with a white beaver fur hat, apparently from an albino beaver. But uh, here is one of the more famous illustrations, uh, John Burns in the battle. Now, this version of it is from the front cover of Civil War Times Illustrated, an issue that I have. I forget what year it is. Maybe it's like 1982. Um, and this is actually a version of it that I got from Hill College, or I'm so sorry, the Hill School 
in um, Pottstown, Pennsylvania, and they have the original painting of John Burns in the battle. Uh, there are other photographs of Burns. Uh, somebody asked if Burns had kids. Um, Burns did not have any children of his own. He only had um, an adopted daughter, we mentioned, Martha Gilbert. And remember, she has an illegitimate child who actually ends up moving to Washington State. Um, this is a photograph by Frederick Gutekunst, and this is actually from Miller's Photographic History of the Civil War, um, this, this uh, particular version. And so here's another early photographer. This was taken in July of 1863 of Burns in front of his house. Um, here is a um, view taken by the uh, Tyson brothers of Gettysburg uh, in late July or early August, 1863. And again, there's Burns on his porch with his musket and one of the photographic assistants at the bottom. You might notice that at the bottom of the stairs, you can see the arm of the assistant. And if we look at the next view, you can see this is a variant of that same view. Um, uh, Okay, we're back. So now what I'd like to do is just show you some images of Burns. So what happened was Burns became very famous. And in December of 1863, a lawyer in Gettysburg, David McConaughey, went on sort of a tour circuit. Um, okay. Uh, David McConaughey decided to take Burns on sort of a tour circuit, took him to a couple places, gave a speech, David McConaughey gave a speech about the battle and what it was like to be there. And, and somewhere on the speech, he introduced John Burns and Burns would come on the stage, you know, perhaps wearing the outfit that he wore during the battle, carrying the musket that he said he used in the fighting and gave a little speech. Uh, Burns was very, very popular with the crowd. Um, the Tyson brothers of Gettysburg had a photographic studio and they recorded images of Burns. And there's an interesting account that during the Gettysburg Address, Burns is in the crowd selling images of himself, which I get a big kick out of. So he became very popular. People wanted to buy his image. Uh, when he went around on the tour circuit, people took his photograph. In 1864, he started to travel with the United States Sanitary Commission. Um, he was in Philadelphia. He was in New York. He ended up in Chicago. He was in Pittsburgh. And, you know, the Sanitary Commission would use him. Uh, they had sort of a, um, a fair, and they put on a little program, and they'd raise money to help wounded, uh, you know, care for wounded from um you know, these, these battles, they would often have a guy who lost his arm or a guy who lost his leg, talk about what it was like to be in a battle, and then had John Burns come up. Um, and, you know, um, he promoted uh, the Sanitary Commission and, of course, maybe also promoted himself a little bit. So let's look at some of the various photographs we have of Burns during this period. One of the things I, 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 I said when I... Um, pulled, started pulling this book together was I'd like to put as many photographs of John Burns as I could in one place. But uh, here we have some, a couple photographs taken in Gettysburg, actually the photograph and a drawing or engraving made from the photograph taken at the Tyson Brothers studio. Here's one of them um, from um, Chicago. Uh, and you just see a backdrop. I really like this image of him. And uh, you can really get an idea of Burns' personality by looking uh, at his face. I should mention, he's of Scottish origin. Um, uh, we know he's born in New Jersey. Uh, we don't know much about his uh, ancestry or his father. Um, but uh, he claimed that he was a, a relative of Robert Burns, the famous Scottish poet, when people would ask him. Uh, here he is in um, New York on the left. 
and I believe in um, uh, Harrisburg, maybe on the right. Uh, again, these are two New York images of him. Uh, and here he is uh, on the left in a New York studio. And on the right, this is a Mumper image uh, taken in Gettysburg when he's uh, a little bit older. Um, here's one that uh, uh, was for sale on um, uh, an auction site on the left not too long ago. Every once in a while, you do see Burns images come up in these auction sites. On the right, I think I just threw that in there, somebody's colorized version of, uh, of Burns under his porch. I have no idea why I did that. Um, I should also mention at this point that I have been shown, I don't know, five times people have brought photographs to me and they swear that it's John Burns. And uh, some of these are just not very convincing at all. But you know, who am I to say, who is John Burns in the photograph and who is not? Um, here is an image of John Burns that appears to be taken uh, late in his life. He died in February of 1872, uh, so just uh, about nine years after he fought in the battle. And he's buried in uh, Gettysburg's Evergreen Cemetery. And here's his tombstone to the left and his wife's tombstone to the right. Uh, in the early 1900s, uh, his tombstone was vandalized for some reason, probably by some locals who didn't appreciate some of the things he had to say. And then uh, uh, John White Johnston here on the right, who I mentioned was writing a book about uh, John Burns, which never was published, had uh, was instrumental along with the Gettysburg uh, GAR of having a, um, uh, I shouldn't say, I guess John White Johnston didn't have much to do with it, but the Gettysburg GAR made sure that Burns had a nice solid memorial uh, replaced his original, uh, replacing his original vandalized grave. Um, uh, I wanted to mention that one of the reasons that local people weren't fond of Burns uh, was the fact that he tried to separate himself from the other townspeople. Uh, in the poem written by Bret Hart, there's a line that he was the only man in town who didn't back down. And, you know, the locals over the years have received uh, a lot of bad press uh, by people who suggest that, well, while the patriotic soldiers are fighting in the field, the cowardly civilians are hiding in their basements. And Burns liked to promote himself as someone who um, was the town hero while the other cowards that you've read about were hiding in their basements. And a lot of townspeople didn't appreciate this much. Also, Burns did not appreciate sharing the limelight with other civilians. And someone had asked a question about Jenny Wade. And uh, Burns, I, I get the feeling that he enjoyed his celebrity as the hero of Gettysburg, and when people would ask about um, Jenny Wade, he would get kind of defensive and upset. And there's a letter written to Burns in 1866 by a guy named Frank Moore, who was writing a book called Women of the War. And he wanted to feature Jenny Wade in the book and wanted John Burns to give him some details about Jenny because he wasn't familiar with, you know, he didn't know anybody else in Gettysburg to write to. And John Burns wrote a letter back to him. And that letter is in the collection at Duke University. And it says something like, Jenny Wade, the less said about her, the better. The story of her baking bread for soldiers. And he, he kind of he kind of talks about how that's not true. And he actually says that she is a she rebel and charity to her reputation forbids any further remarks. So he's kind of nasty. Uh, about Jenny. And, you know, there's probably every reason to believe he's just, you know, kind of jealous that he has to share the spotlight with Jenny. I will bet that when he went around and lectured from place to place to place, when people ask questions, they always want to know about, what about that Jenny Wade? <laughs> you know, and what's really ironic about it is that um, today, 
Jenny Wade and John Burns are almost always discussed together when we talk about the battle, the hero and the heroine of Gettysburg. Now, of course, I've been studying John Burns for a long time. Um, and, uh, you know, I forget exactly when it was that I decided that I wanted to write a book about uh, John Burns. But uh, uh, my book uh, eventually was published. <laughs> And, uh, you know, you can find a copy of it around town. I'm sure you don't want to have any trouble looking or on eBay if you want to learn more about it. I have lots of minutia about John Burns and his life in the book. Um, I did end up calling the book The Hero of Gettysburg. And I think I should tell people that I titled it that because that's what John Burns called himself. And so, um, you know, he's an interesting figure. And, uh, you know, it, I don't think that for me writing about people, I don't think that my heroes have to be perfect, but uh, uh, he's definitely got some eccentricities to his personality uh, that come through in the accounts written about him. So um, I think that, uh, take care, that takes care of our video for tonight. Um, we are planning on doing other videos on Gettysburg civilians uh, in the next few weeks. So we'll keep you updated and let you know when the next program will be. Thank you, Tim. And thank you to everybody who tuned in tonight. We are planning on doing this um, at least bi-weekly for the next uh, month or so. So please check our Facebook page to stay updated. And uh, I really hope you'll consider visiting our website, www.achs-pa.org where you can learn more about what we do, um, all the incredible artifacts and records we preserve here, all the programs we put on for the community. And uh, we hope that you will uh, consider joining and becoming a member of the Historical Society as well. Uh, we need your, your help and your support. And uh, thanks again for, for tuning in tonight, and, and we will have more for you shortly.